<clears throat> so I'm doing this series on prayer, and um, it's not the typical uh, series of, on prayer that maybe you might have been accustomed to. Uh, part of what has shaped a lot of my thinking has been my experiences through uh, my life of time of prayer. And um, how many know that what you don't know can kill you? Right? Or it can be very damaging to you. Or if you misunderstand something. This is really interesting, a little tidbit sidebar here. But, uh, you know, kids love to watch superheroes. And believe it or not, when, when I was a child, I thought that, because Superman was my superhero. Of course, th he was the only superhero back when I was a kid. <laughs> there, there weren't 50 superheroes, right? <laughs> right? Well, Mighty Mouse, but, but I didn't want to become a mouse, you know. <laughs> but I, I kind of fantasized if I put a towel and wrapped it around my neck and made a cape, I could fly. And uh, luckily, I never tested that theory by going on top of my house and jumping off. I, I did jump off the couch, and I realized that, the, the, you know, the cape didn't help me fly at all. Uh, but there are children today that have watched a lot of superhero things and have actually died by doing things like that. And uh, the thing is, they didn't know they believed something that was false, and it cost them their lives. And sometimes we believe things about prayer that just are not what God intended prayer to be about. And because we believe them and then practice them, but then, shall we say, suffered some consequences uh, in how we prayed, uh, Oftentimes, the lack of answers to the prayers that we've prayed has created an undermining of people's faith. And the purpose of this series for me is to help encourage you to pray more, not to pray less, but to pray in a way that uh, you have a greater understanding of prayer and that we can, we can address some misunderstandings of prayer. And so today, I, I want to talk about uh, some unanswered prayers of Jesus and Paul. Uh, unanswered in the way that they were prayed, in a sense. We can always say that, well, every prayer gets answered. It just seems like a lot of them are with no. But that's not really what we're after, is it? <laughs> When we, when we talk about unanswered prayer, we're, we're really wanting to know why, why did what I prayed for, why did what I asked for, why did that not happen in the manner in which I declared it and had faith and passion for it. So I want to begin today by looking at the Apostle Paul, uh, and he writes a really incredible portion of scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And this is what he says. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A let, me, let me stop you for a second. How many know great revelations from God can create pride in your life? <laughs> you wouldn't think that, would you? You would think that getting a great revelation from God would humble us. But oftentimes, we begin to think, look what I know, as opposed to what somebody else doesn't know, and then pride comes in. Mm -hmm. and, and Paul had great revelations. Here was a man that was actually even taken to heaven. And I don't know how long he was there, but obviously he had some deep insights that the average person probably didn't have notwithstanding all of his understanding of the Old Testament scriptures because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And so he had these revelations, and 
one of the things that he started to understand was he had what he called this thorn in the flesh. And there's, a, there's been different debate over what that was and, and so forth. And I'm not here to argue that point. I think it's safe to say that it was something in him, something that affected him physically. I think that's why I called it a thorn in the flesh. We use that term, boy, he's a thorn in the, my flesh. But, you know, what we mean by that is someone that just irritates us. But that's really not what Paul's reference was here. And he refers to this thorn in the flesh as something that was affected him physically. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Interesting. He didn't, he didn't attribute his malady, his illness, this condition, and I'm kind of using a bunch of descriptive, descriptive words here because we don't actually know what it was. Some people assume it was a problem with his eyesight, maybe like macular degeneration, and they think that because of another portion of scripture where he writes, see w with what large letters I'm writing. They, he, didn't, he didn't, like sometimes we'll write capital letters to emphasize a point, but that's not what he's referring to. If they needed to emphasize a point, they didn't use bigger letters. They, they used language in that day to emphasize those things. And so, uh, again, some biblical scholars think that he's referring to some uh, macular degenerative type of disease that was causing him to have poor eyesight, would might even eventually lead to blindness. But interestingly to me, he doesn't say God sent this on him. See, God doesn't send disease to us. We need to understand that. We live in a fallen world. We're subject to the fallenness of this world. Disease is part of this world. And when it comes upon us, God doesn't send that to us. That is actually the result of the fall and sin. And Satan is responsible for that. So Paul just says this was a uh, messenger, shall we say, from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. And then... He said, I'm tired of this. I'm going to pray. And so here's what he said. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Now, what do you get from that word beg? Earnestly. Earnest. He was, he was passionate about this, wasn't it? It wasn't just, now I lay me down to sleep. You know, uh, I pray my Lord the soul to keep, right? He, he was passionate. He begged the Lord about this thing three times. And what ended up happening? Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Wow. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. So Paul understood that the real strength he needed was the strength of the Lord. And that that strength would come when he recognized his own personal weaknesses. Now, like I said moments ago, we don't know specifically what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. And I'm not here to argue that point. I do think, I, I lean in the direction of, uh, because of some other scriptural references, that it was a physical condition. Um, but if this thorn in the flesh was the case, I think Paul was praying for healing for his eyes. Here's a man who had seen miraculous healings. Here's a man who had been a part of demonic deliverance. And he even attributes this condition that he has to a demonic power uh, that was uh, afflicting him. And he prayed three times uh, for this. Uh, this. This man who had seen the miraculous, this man who had seen the power of God move mightily uh, through him, he prayed for deliverance. And the only answer that he received was that God said, my grace is enough for you. Now, I don't know about you, but like, what kind of answer is that? Right? You know? 
I mean, he, he, I mean, Paul goes right out on a limb and says, man, I was begging God for healing. Haven't we all done that, right? For friends, for family, for ourselves at times. But Paul, instead of, instead of saying to God, what kind of answer is that to my passionate prayers? He actually goes on to say that he took glory or pleasure in his weaknesses because he knew that because of his weaknesses that meant God's power was going to come into his life now not necessarily to heal him but rather to sustain him to help him become more by not answering that prayer than would have happened if that prayer would have been answered we wouldn't have faulted Paul for saying, like, what kind of answer is that, I'm sure. Uh, but Paul actually found great comfort in, his, in God's response. My grace is sufficient for you. No more explanation. You know, I'm going to write these words out and put them on the refrigerator because... I'm there a lot. Yeah. And I, We're I, at the refrigerator? No, I guess oh, so. No. <laughs> but I, in the kitchen, you okay. know, I just see things right there on the front of the fridge. Yeah. And I'm going to write that out. My grace is all you need. Yes. My power works best yes. in weakness. For yes. whatever trial I might go, it works for everything. It does, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it's comforting. It is. It is. And in regards to this specific prayer... God was not going to heal him. But God was going to help him deal with the struggle that was going to come about by him not actually healing him. And not only that, but God was going to use Paul's weakness as a benefit to Paul and a benefit to the kingdom. We, and I prayed this way many times, and you may have prayed similarly to me, but I think about someone who needs a miracle, a real miracle, raise someone up off their deathbed, or, uh, you know, some kind of miracle like the withered arm of the man whose arm just grew out, yeah, and, or, or, or we've even heard of people like, like Lori, she's got all this, she, I say it, she's got like a mini Eiffel Tower in her back with all the rods and the steel and all that stuff just kind of holding everything together. And we've heard stories of people being prayed for and, and somehow miraculously all of the metal that's in their bodies just comes right out and falls on the ground and God heals them. And I would love nothing better for that for Lori than for that to happen. Uh, and I've, I've had my own rationale in my own mind as to why that is the way that God could get the most glory, right? Right? And how that is the very best thing for Lori. And I still want that, and I pray for that, and I still hope for that. But what if God has a similar answer for Lori as he had for Paul? That my grace is sufficient for you, and that in your weakness, in your frailty, in your lack, I can come in with a greater measure of power into your life. And if we were able to approach some of this stuff from not as an emotional position as we are at times, but more just rationalistically, what would be the better answer? What would be the better way? Wouldn't it be for God's power to really be in our lives more than just a one-time miracle that would happen. Um, and, we, and yet I believe we should keep asking. We should keep asking. Um, if, if this condition truly was blindness, then this condition would really lead Paul to a greater place of humility, wouldn't it? We had a dear friend, it was... Bernie's brother, who has since passed away. He was part of our church at the beginning for many years. He was on our servant council. And George, his name was George Cruzy, and he had a favorite saying. He said, 
Everybody here walks with a limp. And what he was basically saying is we've all come from a place of brokenness. And that nobody here is perfect. And God's healed us. And yet, just like Jacob, when Jacob was really touched by God, when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, who is Jesus in the Old Testament, when he wrestled with him all night long, and at the end of that wrestling match, Jesus touched him in the hip, and the result of being touched by God was he limped the rest of his life. You know what? It's hard to be proud when you walk with a limp. You don't strut into some room with a limp, do you? You, you can just kind of see arrogance on some people just by how they walk, can't you, right? And nobody with a limp has an arrogant aura about them. And Paul is basically saying, this condition I have has created an ongoing humility in my life. And isn't that a good thing? Because God resists the proud, and what? Exalts the humble. Gives grace to the humble. And he gives grace to the humble, absolutely. So, Paul is in this place where he needs to depend on God. And this humility and condition that he has, when people understand that God is a worker of miracles, yet at the same time, this man loves God, is committed to God, without the miracle that he himself needs, would cause people to actually listen more to his message than less to his message. I'm thinking of, of, of a friend of Lori's today, too, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, who, uh, uh, you know, broke her neck when she was quite young, I think a teenager or someone in that area. And she's now in her 70s. And she has been paralyzed from her neck down virtually her whole life. And I, I would go on record saying that it wouldn't surprise me if Johnny Erickson Tata's life as a paraplegic has touched more people for Jesus than if her life had not been spent in a wheelchair. I think she's had an incredible uh, tenacity to be faithful, to trust the Lord, to keep asking largely. But at the end of the day, what she did, and we're going to look at another prayer of Jesus here in a moment, but what she's done is she surrendered her life to Jesus. And all of us have answers that we would like to see happen. But are we also willing to also say, but not my will, but yours be done? Because that's the real place to surrender. That's right. The it's other thing about Johnny is that she woke us all up to seeing and caring more for people with disabilities. That's right. And, making, and opening the way to help them worldwide. And, and that, is, that is one of the... Uh, that is one of the incredible benefits of sometimes unanswered prayer. The compassion. It creates, it, it creates uh, a need for compassion. Yes. So Paul came to see that every insult and every disaster and every stressful situation that he was under was an opportunity for God to work in perfecting Paul's soul, and in, and in accomplishing all the good that could happen through him. And, and let's never sell that aspect short in our lives. When you go through adversity, when you go through disappointments, when you go through loss, when you go through something that's humbling in your life, maybe a rejection, maybe a spouse abandoned you, left you, abused you, and that's got to be a humiliating thing. Jackie and I are blessed. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this coming Saturday. And I'm just so thankful that we've had this wonderful relationship. And I love to be with you. And we do all sorts of things together. But not everybody has that. And, and it can be disheartening. It can be humiliating. 
on, with some people. And, and let's never sell short the blessings that can come through some of that kind of adversity in a person's life. The struggles that they've had to overcome, the perseverance that they've had to have, instead of just giving up on God. Some people have prayed for their marriages for years and they've never got any better. And it's easy to say, prayer doesn't work. Where's God? And yet, the tenacity and the faithfulness that has been sown year in and year out, year in and year out, has been such a tribute to our walk of faith with, with God. So a second example of unanswered prayer is, of course, the prayer of Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse uh, 42. And, and Jesus obviously prayed this prayer with great emotional distress, right? He was under great distress uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and here's what he prayed. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I was thinking about this prayer. Um, I believe it's truly impossible to ever have true faith without surrender. Let that just kind of sink in a little bit. It's really impossible to have true faith without surrender. A lot of us, you know, we come to God, and he's so merciful, we come to God in our foxholes with the shrapnel falling all around us, right? Whether it's literal or metaphorically, right? God, help! That's most of our prayers when we're pretty ignorant of God, right? You get me out of this jam, I'll serve you. And, and God is faithful, and he's kind, and he listens to those cries. He does. He doesn't say, hey, you made your bed, sleep in it. That's not how God responds to all of our cries from all of our self-inflicted wounds that we have. And yet, uh, I think there's a part of having to understand what it really means to walk with Jesus, that it's not just about bargains with God all the time. I'll do this if you do that. But rather, not what I want, but you want. God. Not what I want, but you want. You talked a little bit about surrender in your Mother's Day message. And even though that was a little bit different perspective, there's still an aspect of surrender. To we it. were talking about surrendering, you know, all of our hurts, surrendering our past. We can't change it. Just ask God to help you. Just surrender to it. This is what happened. And then let him come in and stop fighting it. Yeah. And, but and surrender your anger. Yes. Yeah. And then we go forward, and, and we need to surrender our present and surrender our future. future. Just surrender it all. That's right. So I, I, I believe it's safe to say that when Jesus prayed for this cup to be removed, uh, he, he was referring to the level of suffering that was leading up to and including the crucifixion. I don't believe Jesus was praying not to die. I, I don't believe that. Jesus said on many occasions, uh, a, a good shepherd gives up his life for the sheep, and that he knew why he came. He wasn't praying not to give his life. He wasn't praying not to die. But he was praying for some of the consequences of what were about to happen to be alleviated. The level of pain, the level of affliction, the level of suffering, and even possibly the separation from God. Because he understood the sins of mankind were going to be laid on him. And the consequences of sin is what? Separation from God. Now, now picture this for a moment. That Jesus in his eternal existence had never been separated from God. His father. That had never been broken. That had never been broken. And on the cross, we can understand a little bit why he might in that moment when the weight of the sins of mankind past present and future were laid on him because he was our substitute so all of our iniquities were laid on him as the scriptures say as that moment happened 
for him to have a true substituted penalty for us, he had to suffer what we would have suffered, which is separation from God. And in that moment, I believe is when he cried out, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing this separation from God for the very first time in his life. But he wasn't praying to not die. But God did not deliver him from his suffering, did he? God did not deliver him from the separation. God didn't answer that prayer of Jesus. And frankly, aren't you and I happy that God didn't? I by am. By stripes we are healed. That's right. By stripes we're healed. And the sufferings that he went through, we, are, we have so much provided for us. P prayer provided our pardon and forgiveness. That cross provided that. And, and Jesus did feel this separation from God as the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, were laid on him. And he actually experienced what sin actually causes. And I think when he was praying, remove this cup from me, he, he, he didn't want that intimacy with God to be fragmented, to be, be separated. And because of that, he was praying, remove this cup from me, but nevertheless, what? Not my will, but yours be done. Yours be done. It's very possible that Jesus was enduring the suffering of the passion that he might have even, maybe he even felt disappointment on the cross. He might have felt disappointment. Have you ever felt disappointment when your prayers didn't get answered? I have. Pray for people. You feel God leads you to do something, especially in the realm of healing. Go pray for this person. I want you to go pray for this. Oh, they're going to get healed. And you drive across town, you lay hands on them, you pray for them, and you pray in faith, and you pray earnestly. And a week later, they're, they're dead. And you don't want to tell anybody. Right? You don't want to tell anybody. You don't say, well, I, you know, I prayed for them. You don't want to admit to that. You only say that when... Yeah, you only admit to that right. when someone gets healed. Well, you know, I prayed for them. I mean, see the, how the pride can come in? Right? Right? So, I think it's very possible that as Jesus was enduring the suffering of the passion, that he did feel this disappointment as he began to, to actually experience this beginning of this separation and all of the things that he had asked that possibly could be delivered, he could be delivered from. And I think that when the book of Hebrews says he was made in all points such as we, yet without sin, that he experienced all the things that we've experienced, I think he even experienced disappointment. I think he experienced because he, he gave up his, uh, uh, an aspect of his divinity, one of which was uh, his omniscience. He gave that up to become Jesus. He, the scripture says he grew and learned in the admonition of the Lord. So if he had omniscience, he didn't need to do that, right? So he, he, he gave that aspect up. At, after the resurrection and the ascension, all of that was, shall we say, downloaded back into him, if I can use a kind of a computer language or whatever, right? Uh, and I don't understand. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a finite human being. I'm trying to understand things of the infinite here that don't have full explanation in scriptures. But I think we can get a little bit of a picture that Jesus, what Jesus suffered was not only a, an intrepidation or maybe almost even a fear uh, or an anxiety over, over the sufferings that were going to come upon him. He was praying, remove this cup from me. He was, I think he experienced disappointment. He experienced all the things that we experience in life, yet without sin. When he was praying that, they said he was praying so earnestly, yes, yes. He, he sweat drops of blood. Yes, yes. And we know, even though he cried out, why have you forsaken me? It felt like he was forsaken. Have you ever felt forsaken by God? 
Anybody? Can you raise your hands? Have you ever actually felt as though God wasn't there for you? Yeah. And I think Jesus felt that too. That's why he said that. He wouldn't have said it if he didn't somehow feel it. And yet, we know today that uh, God did not forsake him. We know that. God did not forsake him. We know that God used the sufferings of Jesus and his death to bring redemption to the entire world, to offer it to every single person in the entire face of the earth. Wow, what a surprise to Satan. Right? Satan thinks he's won, he's, he's killed the Messiah, he's done, gone forever, and then he shows up in Hades saying, I'll take those keys, right, of hell, death, and the grave. And then he says to all those who were captive, because of the law can't save anybody, and he says, come on, boys and girls, follow me. And on to heaven they went. I mean, what a celebration. Can you just picture the look in Satan's face when all that was taking place? I like to imagine that. The shock, the, the imps around, G, uh, around Satan saying, what do we do now? <laughs> and he does his best Cliff Clavin impression. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So, so what do these two accounts of unanswered prayer teach us? Well, at the very least... They teach us that God does not always answer our prayers, even when we offer them in sincere faith and at times with great desperation. Sometimes I prayed the most innocuous prayers, and boom, they get answered. And other times I prayed with such passion, I knew that God just had to answer me. And he didn't, the way I prayed. These two accounts also teach us that while God may not answer our prayers as we pray them, God never abandons us. He never abandons us. In fact, more than that, these accounts tell us that God actually works through the circumstances that we're praying for, even though we might pray, if I dare say the word amiss. I don't know if I want to use that word amiss, because here's the thing. We all have finite understanding. So if I'm going to have finite understanding, I'm going to ask largely. I'm going to ask largely because I believe that with God all things are possible. So he I'm going to ask largely. Anything. He can do anything. You know, I, I, I do believe that. And his love is so great. Yeah. Well, at the same time, I know that God's not going to give me wealth just by me watching television all day long sitting on my couch. Yeah. Amen. Right? He's not going to give me A's on tests if I don't study. Right, Andrew? Yeah, you just graduated from college. Did you have to study a little bit? Yeah, a lot, right? You didn't, you didn't get A's by, by partying all night long and not going to class and just showing up for finals. And, and then praying before the test, and then God gives you an A. It doesn't work that way, all right? That's not the anything that Jesus is talking about, right? But we see that God teaches us that God works through our circumstances and our situations precisely because he hasn't abandoned us, not because he did abandon us. Precisely because he didn't abandon us, he is with us through these challenges, these difficulties, these disappointments, these losses. And Paul's blindness was an opportunity for the power of God to be displayed in Paul and for his own faith to be deepened. The crucifixion of Jesus became the most powerful sign of God's sacrificial love and human redemption that the world has ever known. It became God's vehicle for the salvation of the human race. Did you know that before the resurrection, the cross was simply a symbol of an executioner. But after the resurrection, what did the cross become? 
It became a symbol of God's love and his mercy and his grace. And people all over the world wear them. But you know what? People don't wear a hangman's noose or, or an electric chair around their necks. If, if someone did that, you'd say, you're weird, you know? What, what goofy side of the plant did you come from, right? But we wear crosses. Did you know when Jesus was a young boy, in one fell swoop, the Romans crucified 2,000 people in one day? Jesus understood there was a visible, regular demonstration to the people of Israel what the results were when you crossed the Roman Empire. Crucifixions were something that they perfected. They were the executioners of executioners, the Romans. They knew how to kill people and make them still stay alive for days and suffer. It wasn't the killing that people feared. It was the suffering that people feared. And I think that partly contributed to Jesus' prayer. And yet, at the end of it all, his prayer was what? Not my will, but yours be done. And when we can come to that place of surrender, that's when I think our faith really can grow more deeply. Sometimes unanswered prayers lead to events that change the world or change us. I think Paul's unanswered prayer certainly changed Paul and, he, and to some degree all of us who've heard his messages. I think Jesus' unanswered prayer has caused us to understand the great commitment of his love to endure that suffering and that passion. And that has transformed the hearts of many, many people. Do you know that a lamb that died at the hands of a high priest did not change anybody's hearts? You know why? Because that lamb didn't go willingly to that slaughtering house. But Jesus, they didn't drag him to the cross. He carried his own cross to his own place of execution. He willingly went there. He said, we must needs now go to Jerusalem. What was waiting for him at Jerusalem? All the suffering, all the pain, and the agony, and the death. He willingly went. When we see how willing Jesus was, that's what transforms our lives. That's what changes us. That's what can touch our hard hearts. So God, of course... It's not that God wishes evil to come upon us so that our lives will be changed. But God uses the fallenness of this world, the evil of this world, and all the heartache and the the rejection and all the pain and, yes, even disease at times to bring us into a deeper place of faith with him and commitment to him through our surrender to him. In a world where suffering and tragedy do and will occur, God uses these things in a redemptive way when we submit to him. But we have to submit to him. It's hard for God to bring redemption out of a circumstance and situation when we're not submitted or yielding to him in it. And that's why I pray every day, Lord, I give everyone and everything to you. And then I have to just rest that what is happening in spite of my consternation, my anxiety, my disappointments or whatever, that God has not said, woo, I saw what you said over here. I'm out of here, boy. He'd have left me a hundred times in the golf tournament that I played on last Thursday with Sean. Nothing can take me from your great love. That's right. And you know, it's usually hardship and challenges and suffering and tragedy that most often lead to the development of character in our lives. It's usually suffering and challenges and hardship and tragedy that also create compassion in our lives for other situations. Very few people have compassion without witnessing and seeing hardship and difficulty and challenges. And so these These things, compassion, 
and character tear down the walls of oppression. God is wanting an ultimate end to oppression, but he allows it to happen so that we will be compassionate and bring those walls down. Does this mean that God brings tragedy into our lives directly in order to make us better people? Absolutely not. I don't believe God brings tragedy into our lives. But we do live in a fallen world. We live where these things happen. And God is always walking along with us as we surrender to him to help bring his power into our lives, his grace into our lives, that we'd be uh, sufficient. So, he sees the big picture. He sees the big picture. So I yes. want to read one more verse and then we'll be done. And we see what Paul says uh, that in Romans 8, 28, we all know this verse, but I'm going to read it in four different translations this morning uh, where Paul says this, Romans 8, 28, NLT. Uh, NLT? N N NIV. NIV. And we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So God, uh, we know that in all things. So how much is all? In this case, it's all. In this case, it's all. Okay. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Do you love God? Everything that happens in your life, God's goal is to bring good from it. Every single thing. Your disappointments, your hardships, your challenges, your illnesses, every single thing that God is bringing into you, that allows to come into your life or that comes into your life, God wants to bring good out of it. Let's look at NLT. It's easier for him to do that when we've surrendered. That's right. Surrender is such an important part of it. Mm -hmm. NLT. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Yeah, that's just another wonderful way of saying it. It's now uh, the message. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something Good. See, I like how Eugene Peterson says that. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. And then the uh, Passion Translation. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. So God has a purpose for our lives. Generally speaking, a broad definition of that is to love God supremely and love each other unconditionally. That's God's purpose for us. But there are many things that kind of hinder that. This fellow we talked about yesterday, he's going to be on our podcast. He carried anger in his heart towards a family member for many years. And it hindered his walk with his family, and it hindered his walk with God. And he said... If he called it like this. When I went and said, please forgive me for this, will you please forgive me for this? He said it felt like this huge monkey had been taken off of his back. Isn't that good description? Just, just this thing that had his tentacles into him was taken off of him. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good because we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose for us. So when you pray, pray largely, ask largely, uh, ask in faith, ask trust. I think it's good to even declare things that aren't as though they are. I agree with all of that. I'm not coming against any of that. But what I am saying is this. We are finite human beings. And we don't have God's view of things. And there is a mystery side of things in our walk with God as well, which we hate. Let's just admit it. How many love the mystery of God? Well, that liar raised his hand. <laughs> we hate it. We don't like mystery. We want to know everything. Like the first word we ever learned was why, or maybe it was mine first and then why, right? Selfishness and give me an explanation right? But 
God is not under obligation to give us all the information at his disposal. And there are reasons that he wants us to surrender to him because that is how we trust in him. That is how we trust in him. And so in these seasons where we have prayers that don't get answered in the way we prayed them, we can know that God's not abandoned us. We can know that he will never leave us or forsake us, that nothing will ever separate us from his love, that this didn't happen because God's angry with us and he's getting back at us for something we did or something my grandfather did or something my great-grandfather did, but rather he is going to work his power into our lives because his grace is sufficient for us. But we have to receive it. Paul could have said to God, that ain't fair. Couldn't he have? I don't like this. Not going to do it. I'm out of here. And many have done that. And the reason I want to do this series is because if it happened to the Apostle Paul and Jesus that they had prayed things that didn't get answered in the way they prayed them, it's going to happen to you too. Maybe more so. <laughs> Maybe more so. And I don't want you to get discouraged thinking, what did I do wrong? Or why don't I have enough faith? Or how do I get more faith? Or any of these kind of things that bring nothing but condemnation into our lives. But just keep trusting God. Just keep surrendering to God. And when we do that, we will find that we have this strength, this grace that comes to us to help us in our struggles, in our disappointments, in our failures, in our rejection. But there will be a power brought into our lives that otherwise we would have missed out on because God says, his grace is sufficient for us. Can I read what, he, what yeah. it said here? My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Yeah. Wow. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your power works best in our weakness. My next message, I'm going to cover how does God answer prayer? And what is the purpose of prayer? And what should we pray for? So I hope you'll tune in, you know, and, and listen, because these are really important things. How does God answer prayer? And what should we pray for? And what is the purpose of prayer? But today, when you leave here today, you're in good company when you've had prayers that didn't go or didn't get answered in the way that you wanted them to be answered, because you're in the good company of the Apostle Paul and Jesus.